All right, so if I can get Dr. Hussein to share, to turn on his video and start sharing his screen, get that geared up, ready to go. This is Dr. Hussein, who is speaking on controlling cell signaling and activation using peptide therapy. Dr. Hussein, you there? I'm here, I'm working on the, uh, the video for a minute. I just requested that you turn that on. Yeah. Uh, you may, yeah, turn that on. And then also if you can start your screen share. Um, while we're waiting on Dr. Hussein to pop that in, let's go over to our question. I think we have time for maybe one. Uh, and this comes from uh, Lisa Geyer. A uh, great question. And again, this is not a, uh, a prescription or by any means, please always, uh, we, have to, we have to give our medical disclaimers for the lawyers. Uh, please always consult with your physician. Uh, this is great question. Will PK-16 work with glioblastoma? What is the best peptide for glioblastoma? Well, <clears throat> so she's asking a question about if can you start to bring these type of um, of these oncogenetic um, inhibitors like the uh, that that affect specifically the MDM2 and MDM4. And in fact, um, there are some clinical trials where they're looking at MDM2 inhibitors for anaplastic astrocytomas, gliomas, and glioblastoma multiformes, uh, which are, are where she's talking about in, in brain tumors. So this is actually a new part of a new field. In, in, just like Chris had said in the beginning, a lot of disease, a lot of things coming, uh, treatments coming out of hematological diseases are being used in treating other cancers. And so that is absolutely being looked at right now um, in, in treatment protocols, um, not specifically this, uh, this peptide, um, uh, but it, it's being discussed and it's only in phase one clinical trials, you know, within leukemia right now. So, but they're using MDM2 inhibitors specifically in clinical trials for treating, um, astrocytomas or, uh, 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 glioblastoma multiformes, which are grade four type of astrocytoma. So, so he, this is incredible because there's, again, this just gets back to the polygenetic nature of tumors and where we can go with these treatments, but that's where it's going. Uh, Lisa, that's, that's where it's going and uh, great to see you and great to hear you here on our, our, our forum. So let me get to Dr. Hussein here and introduce him. Um, a bit. I can't. I can't thank you enough for being part of this. Um, you've been in a, a, you, He is a uh, integrative cardiologist in Colorado and in Denver, outside of Denver, I think. Correct. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. And he's been with me for a couple of years now. And I, I'll tell you, uh, he uh, he is an amazing physician in, in what he's doing and. Uh, in his practice and in integrating the cellular mechanisms and improving the lifestyles of his patients. But it, but better yet, um, he's a, he's a great doc and he's a good person. And I've met his wife multiple times who uh, keeps him on his toes also, just like my wife. And uh, so we have an appreciation of the, of the happiness of, right. Keep your wife happy and life is happy. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so he is, uh, he's just a great guy and, uh, and, and always asking uh, great questions like everybody else. And it's, you know, there's a reason you're, he's here, uh, a phenomenal doc and a smart guy. And uh, we love having you here. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to you and thank you for being part of this. Uh, well, thank, thanks, Bill. Thank you, Dr. Seeds. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to be part of this project on a personal and professional level. Um, it's uh, it's it's a it's a it's a pleasure and a privilege to represent uh, the SSRP in this venture, and and also on a personal level, uh, my you know my father passed away from uh, T cell lymphoma about a year and a half ago, and so being able to uh, contribute to the the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is is really uh, meaningful for me on a personal level, and um, I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Um, so. My, my lecture today is, is uh, you know, it, we're calling it uh, controlling cell signaling and activation using, using peptide therapy. Um, what, that, what that boils down to is gonna be 
what are peptides doing on a more general uh, on a more general outlook, more general scale? A lot of everybody's talked about very specific peptides and uh, how they work um, on very specific uh, pathways and markers. I'm going to be talking in a, you know, on a more general level to give you an idea of how peptides work and also um, how they're how that's going to be connected to um, cancer uh, suppression and tumor regulation um, and prevention of cancer. Uh, and we're going to, and I'll also touch on some of the most uh, fundamental things that, uh, that the peptides work on to help, to help make that happen. Um, so uh, there we go. So what, what is a peptide? Uh, people of uh, the other physicians have, have alluded to it. And Dr. C's mentioned it specifically. Uh, you know, peptides are small chains of amino acids. Uh, specifically, there are 50 amino acids in, in length or less. Uh, and they're usually sandwiched between two other components, a, a amine group and a carboxyl group. Uh, that, that provides some of the stability. When amino acid chains get bigger than 50, they're called polypeptides. And when they're greater than 100, they're called proteins. Why is that significant? Because as you get to larger sizes, these amino acids start having more complex uh, folding structures and more complex uh, uh, structure. They become more bulky and they don't have the same properties that peptides do. Um, the small size that peptides have allows these, these molecules to traverse deep into the cell and to stimulate our natural metabolic path pathways, uh, either stimulate or inhibit. Um, Peptides, so they're the ideal signaling and messaging agents that our cells use to communicate not only intracellularly within the cell, but outside of the cell to other organs that are distant from where they may be, where this uh, pathway may be, be stimulated. Um, and the peptides themselves are not only, they, they can be the actual hormones or agents that, that, in, that uh, impact change, or they can stimulate the DNA to transcribe other proteins or other small uh, other peptide sequences that will impact hormones and metabolic function further down the, down the pathway. Um, one of the most important uh, signaling pathways that we have is the communication between the mitochondria and, and the nucleus. And um, in this diagram, uh, we're only seeing a few of these communication pathways. But it's, uh, it's important to, to know that this communication goes both ways. It's a, it's a dialogue that's constantly happening between the nucleus and the mitochondria. And the mitochondria has its own DNA, and we know the nucleus has, has DNA. And these pathways allow for communication in one direction, the mitochondria to respond or the nucleus, and then communication back to the other, to the other organelles. So this is a, a dynamic um, efficient communication uh, that is required and, and necessary to maintain uh, health and, and uh, maintain uh, all of our regulatory mechanisms. So the, just like in a relationship, just like, you know, when we want to keep everybody happy, better communication means more efficiency, means everybody's happier. So metabolic efficiency is what we're looking for um, and maintains health and well-being. When we introduce inflammation, poor diet, sedentary lifestyles, sedentary lifestyle, uh, genetic insults, even toxins, this causes a breakdown of that communication. Um, and then it causes mitochondrial inefficiency. This leads to dysfunctional metabolism, uh, disrupted homeostasis, genetic instability, which is key for, for tumor suppression and uh, for cancer prevention and also poor responses to stressors, um, as well as inadequate healing. Um, all of these mechanisms get recruited when, uh, when our, our, our recruited when our, our cells are functioning well and they get recruited effectively. When this communication is broken down, each one of these, these, um, these processes uh, break down. So when you look at it in further detail, the, one of the underpinning, uh, one of the, the, the one of the underpinning issues with mitochondrial inefficiency is the uh, lack of or, of or decrease of a key cofactor called NAD. So peptides indirectly or, or even directly have a profound effect on NAD. 
So what is NAD? Uh, NAD is a nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Um, I'm not going to say that again. I'm only going to refer to it as NAD from now on. It is a cofactor that is used by every cell in our body. Um, and it is used specifically by in the mitochondria by the Krebs or citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain to um, generate our most fundamental unit of energy. And that's ATP. So not only does it, is it involved with ATP generation, but NAD is on its own directly involved with DNA repair via what are called PARP enzymes. It's involved with um, maintaining telomere length, longevity, and selecting the right type of metabolism, or the right kind of, uh, which we'll go into a little bit later, uh, via CERT genes, and regulating immune function via CD38 glycoproteins. So NAD creates the energy that we need, but it is also directly involved with key mechanisms to maintain health and homeostasis. Uh, we can see here just diagrammatically a little bit easier, easier to, to, to uh, absorb. It's involved with DNA repair, immune cell signaling, telomere length, neurotransmitter brain, and brain health, um, what's not mentioned here is it's also involved with circadian rhythms. It's involved with, um, as we note here, um, energy production, uh, antioxidant reactions. Um, NAD has a profound effect on our whole system. So how do NAD and peptides, how are they connected? How, how, how do they relate to each other? Well, peptide signaling starts to decline in our, 80, in our, uh, in our 30s. Um, our bodies start slowing production of peptides, and then the peptides that are already there aren't as effective. Now, when hormone production is, all, is intimately linked with peptide function, peptides are what stimulate hormones to be produced or inhibited. So as the, hormone, as the peptide function declines, so does hormone function. And in particular, you know, growth hormone, testosterone, estrogen, thyroid, these are all, these are all vital hormones that maintain our function and not, not just our youth, but our vitality and our, and our ability to, to fight um, disease and cancer, can development of cancer. Um, this overall metabolic decline results as a reduction a re of the pool of NAD. And this, this reduction of pool of NAD has negative domino effects across the whole body. So it's now postulated that one of the central factors in genomic stability and aging is this pool of NAD. So I mentioned before some of the, some of the pathways directly that rely directly on NAD. Um, this goes into it in a little more detail. The CERT genes, which are also called the sirtuin genes, these are, um, these are proteins that that rely that uh, uh, regulate healthy cell turnover, survival, and apoptosis. So, what does that mean? It means that when a cell is going to stay uh, healthy, it'll divide normally. It'll divide in a healthy way. It'll go through the cell cycle as it's supposed to. It'll be able to survive stress. And then, when it's time for the cell to to die, it'll die appropriately without without releasing toxins and without turning into a uh, a cell that may promote cancer. Um, PARP, enzyme, uh, PARP uh, proteins, which are uh, poly ADP ribose polymerase proteins. These are uh, uh, proteins that specifically uh, are involved with DNA repair. Uh, these monitor DNA, uh, the DNA structure, and when there is either a spontaneous uh, DNA change that is unhealthy or when we have UV damage that causes DNA change, changes in DNA structure, these enzymes move in immediately to, to uh, repair the damage, and they do it uh, constantly. This is, uh, this is one of the largest demands of, of uh, NAD because our bodies uh, have, these, uh, have these insults happen constantly, and we need a vigilant uh, repair mechanism that takes care of that, and that's what PARP does. Uh, if you look at, and then the, you look at our metabolism, what what happens? Uh, what we choose as uh, as our source for metabolism is uh, is also um, is also regulated by NAD. The hypoxic inducible factor alpha one is uh, one of the 
proteins that is involved with the change of a cancer cell to become uh, to become an aerobic uh, excuse me change the change of the cancer cell from a normal metabolism to an aerobic glycolysis happens via hypoxic inducing factor one and this is one of the hallmarks of um, of uh, cancer and NAD helps to prevent that uh, when you look at PGC1 alpha peroxisome proliferating activating receptor um, alpha one. Uh, this regulates what we use as far as metabolism. And that also is important in, um, in cellular efficiency and how we decide when we're going to go into uh, cellular efficiency and how, and how much energy we can make and, and our pools of NAD. NAD is directly involved with, uh, as mentioned, um, uh, oxidation of free radicals. It's involved with circadian rhythms and immune function. So NAD it uses it creates it creates um, uh, so so the, the choice of food that we have is is uh, vital in in determining the efficiency of uh, of our of our um, mitochondria. Um, the mitochondria chooses fatty acids and glucose to create NAD and ATP. Um, when we look at what uh, our what what substrate our mitochondria uses, it's important to know that fatty acids are are our preferred choice, and it can produce up to six times more energy as uh, mitochondria as um, glucose does. Why is that important? Because cancer cells prefer the use of glucose, and when they use glucose, they become less efficient, and they um, and they produce more toxins. Um, AT, when we when we have a uh, when we have effective communication between the nucleus and the and the mitochondria, we prefer fatty acids. We maintain uh, mitochondrial efficiency, and we also uh, reduce the, the chance of having DNA conversion into some sort of tumor type uh, situation. So when you look at it in its totality, mitochondrial nuclear communication, NAD production. And, and metabolic um, and metabolic uh, substrate are are the underpinnings of disease genetic stability immune dysregulation um, and tumor suppression. So back back to you know back to looking at the uh, at how this relates to peptides. Um, you know much of the decline that occurs with aging is a function of uh, decline of growth hormone. Uh, growth hormone is one of the key hormones that regulates mitochondrial function. It, um, it, it's involved with the choice of using uh, fatty acids as a substrate. It's involved with uh, more generation of ATP. It's involved with uh, PGC1 alpha and, and all of those uh, specific markers that we went over before. It also, um, you know, it also has, uh, has Im improved um, stem cell activation. So what we're looking at here is when we have reduction of growth hormone, we have reduced metabolism of fatty acids, um, reduction of uh, ATP generation, and uh, reduced stem cell activation, and um, increased cellular cortisol production. Now that all reverses if we have enough growth hormone. Well, when we look at so bringing this back to peptides, um, you know why hasn't why haven't peptides been used in the past? Well, they they actually they have been. Peptides have been used in treatment for almost 100 years. Um, the first peptide and the most widely known peptide is insulin. Um, and this was derived from livestock and given therapeutically. Uh, in the 50s, labs started formulating peptides because they had chemical sequencing and, and, uh, and protein sequencing and chemical synthesis. Um, when um, after the 50s, the you know, pharmaceutical companies were trying to formulate peptides, but they weren't able to do it in a focused manner, mostly because they didn't have the understanding of what it was, was going on genomically. Um, so it was limited to large pharmaceutical companies um, and, and nowhere else. Um, but libraries of peptides were sequences were being discovered uh, through isolation of natural products. We were looking at plants, other exotic products, and, and other sources to see how they affected the body and, um, and determining and, and formulating, formulating them from, from that perspective. Here's some examples of the peptides that were, that were formed using that methodology. As you can see, insulin is on there, vasopressin, um, oxytocin, 
glucagon, some that are very familiar. Um, so after 2000, with the completion of the Human Genome Project, we had we had much more specific understanding of of, uh, of peptides and targets to use for therapeutic intervention, and um, and since then, peptides technology has exploded, um, mostly because not just because of the Human Genome Project, but because of a convergence of technology that's allowed for small scale formulation, understanding of the biochemistry chemistry and, and stabilization of these products. So when we look at current peptides, they, they have, um, they, they're not specific, they don't, they target spe specific, um, specific receptors, but they also have profound downstream uh, influences like that domino effect, but they're, they're positive downstream effects. Um, because they're so small, they can reach the cell in a way that other proteins can't. Um, because they're so small, the body can actually regulate them more effectively than larger scale proteins. Um, and then they have a short half-life, which reduces the, uh, the uh, side, side effects that, that, they may ex that you may experience with them. And then they, you don't have an immune reaction to them, or you don't, and again, you have less side effects because it's a naturally occurring compound. So when we look at, so when we look at the current, uh, current use of peptides, one of the most popular uh, peptide classes are called secretagogues. Uh, and these are a class of peptides that increase growth hormone production. Now, alluding back to some of the other slides, growth hormone decreases as we get older, and this increases our chances for potential for, for, for cancer and reduces tumor suppression. Um, when you take these two peptides together, GHRH and GHRPs, you know, referred to, you know, uh, shortly, um, they, uh, they increase the pituitary's ability to secrete growth hormone and, and they do it in a way that the body can still regulate. So by increasing our endogenous uh, uh, growth hormone with these peptides, we have more efficient generation of NAD. We have um, more mitochondria. We have increased NAD pools, and we upregulate or improve all of those factors that 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 were um, that we were concerned about before. We improve our utilization of fat. We improve our NAD pools. Decrease uh, cortisol. I mean, decreased cellular cortisol, which improves our stress response. Uh, and improved satellite stem cell uh, activation and uh, recruiting. So when we look at it in total here, the future of cancer suppression lies in mitochondrial function, preserving mitochondrial function, reversing mitochondrial dysfunction, NAD optimization, and, and um, yeah, and ma maintaining these for, for genomic stability, tumor suppression, and improving longevity. Uh, here are some of the references that I've used to get uh, to put this together. And again, thank you all very much. Um, thanks you, thank you for uh, the the Leukemia and uh, Lymphoma Society. And as you know, as everyone has mentioned, we encourage you to donate because without uh, without uh, their help and new research, to uh, uh, we will be we will never be able to make any progress in this uh, terrible disease. Thank you. Ben, I got to say thank you so much. And wow, you took an incredibly complex topic and you really narrowed it down to just bringing home the importance of cell efficiency and why that is so important in maintaining the appropriate NAD pool that is necessary for mitochondrial function that is necessary to keep the cell surviving basically and, and to stop those mutagenic changes and DNA problems that occur. And that ability that you put, the, the way you frame that around the metabolic flexibility about the cell having decision-making and being able to pick out the fatty acids to maximize the oxidative state, uh, the, uh, the uh, pho oxidative phosphorylation of the mitochondria to produce, you know, the ATP necessary and to 
to uh, to make the cell more efficient. Um, I think you did it brilliantly and brought it together really well for people to understand how important efficiency is in helping to prevent disease process, but also just as important in in mitigating problems that occur even during cancer. So thank you so much for taking a very, very difficult topic and making it so simple for all of us. Thank you, man. Yep, thanks for the opportunity again. Thank Appreciate you, Dr. Hussein, and your story about your dad. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Chris very and I were exciting. texting behind the scenes going, oh my gosh, there's a... Uh, there's so many of these stories and, and we're looking at the comments on the donation page and so many people are, I, I just didn't realize how common blood cancers were. So thank you again. Uh, that was, that was an amazing, amazing lecture.